And welcome everybody to another show of the Shabbat Show, another week. It's great to be back with you again. It's amazing just how these weeks are flying by. It's an honor to be back again for another show with you right now. Happy 4th for those that are wherever you are. If you're celebrating the 4th, happy 4th. Uh, and Shabbat Shalom. This has been an incredible, incredible run, and hopefully it will continue going throughout the summer. And happy summer to everybody. Today's, today's topic really is at the core of what Shabbat is. Every week, as you know, we try to hit a different aspect of Shabbat. Today, we're actually trying to get deeper into the essence of what it is. And I want to share with you a story. So for me, I had a guy that worked for me years ago. I was working in a, in a law firm and I had a bunch of people that we worked together and we were so close. One of my friends we was sitting up late at night once and I had mentioned to him that I had to get things done because it was Thursday and I had to get home for Shabbat. And he said to me, what's Shabbat? I said, you know, it's a thing. He goes, no, I'm Jewish, but I don't, I don't know what Shabbat is. I'm like, wait, you're Jewish. You don't know what Shabbat is? I'm like, no. I'm like, why don't you come for Shabbat? He's like, nah, I don't know. I don't think so. It's a whole story. Not for now, but I finally convinced him to just spend one Shabbat with me just to come my house. It's me. Like we hang out all day. Like how scary could it be if it's me? So he agrees. Comes to my house. And it was one of those early Shabbats. And Shabbat started, I don't know, like at five or five, something like that. It's three o'clock. It's four o'clock. He's not there. It's 4.30. He's not there. It's 4.50. He's not there. It's five o'clock. He's not there. I'm like, it's okay. Like he's probably whatever it was. It's fine. I get dressed up. I'm about to, about to go to, to synagogue, about to go to shul. And as I open my door at 5.03, the area is standing there at my doorstep, t-shirt, jeans, and a six pack of Coronas. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, what are you doing? And why are you dressed up for? Like, are you going to a wedding? I'm like, I got no time to talk. I'm like, get inside. I tell my kids, I'm like, get me a suit, get me a shirt, get me a thing before you know, my kids turn into like little busy bees. And they're getting me shirts, suits. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, I put a shirt on him, a tie on him, a whole thing. I give my wife the Coronas. I'm like, let's go. He's like, where are we going? I'm like, let's go. We go to synagogue, we go to shul, the place is rocking. We come home. We have this whole meal. The guy's looking at me like I've never eaten this, this well in my whole life. We go to bed, we wake up, we go through a whole thing. We come back to work the next week and I outside my office. Is him and another guy talking. And I said, what's going on, guys? They're like, well, we don't want to say, we'll say something. But we, we don't want it to be offensive. I'm like, yeah, it's me. Like, we grew up and we thought that Shabbat was the day of rest. I'm like, yeah, it is. He's like, day of rest. He's like, I spent Shabbat in your house. He goes, I'm exhausted. It's like, day of rest? I needed the whole Sunday to recover from your Shabbat. What rest? I thought we were coming and we're gonna drink a six pack on the couch for 25 hours. Like that would be rest. What you did was not restful. How is it a day of rest? Now I had never heard that question before, but isn't that the question? Day of rest? Really? That's what Shabbat is? You know Shabbat's number four on the, on the top 10 list of 10 commandments? Number four? We have the day, day off at number four? Shabbat is a day of rest because what God was tired, really? Like he had an exhausting week building the whole world and he, he needed to like kick up for a weekend. So like we do that, like what's going on here? Is it really a day of rest or is it a day of something totally different? Shabbat today is something, but it's not a day of rest. So what is it? I'm going to play you a video. And in this video, we're going to build the show around this. When you see the video, you'll get a layer of understanding to disconnect, to connect to what's off our technologies. But I want you to watch the video and look at it from a little bit of a deeper perspective. Shabbat is trying to do something very specific. And if we get it, it'll make sense. But if we miss it, will miss the real joy and the beauty of what's really behind it. The show, we're going to talk about this. The show is sponsored by an anonymous donor and by Moshe and Dina Krieger of Toronto in honor of Rabbi and Rabbits and Simcha and Esti Tolwin of Ace Detroit. What an incredible family. I know them well. Remember, we've got a great show coming up for you. But beforehand, let's go to this video 
check this out. This is a very touching video for me that we did this video a long time ago. This is one of my first videos. So I hope you like it. Check it out. Special shout out to the Ornava group, Ray Wallerstein, Ellie Chev, all those that made that possible, and to Giorman for pulling that together. This is a little bit is what we're getting at here. What's the goal of Shabbat? What are we disconnecting from and why are we disconnecting from it? That's what we're going to talk about today. We got a great show. We got a great show lined up for you. First of all, we got Kahoot. If you remember last week, it got really intense with some new entrants to the game. Please continue to join and join quick because there's a lot going on for Kahoot. Get it down, kahoot.it. You can get it on your phone or just check it. Get it ready on your computers now so when we go to it, you don't got to wait. We got a jam-packed week. Mrs. Debbie Greenblatt's with us. Rabbi Yisrael Majeski from Los Angeles is with uh, with us. Saul Werdiger, incredible guy, business tycoon, larger-than-life CEO, wonderful, wonderful individual is with us as, as well. We've got a great student leader from the University of Maryland. Justin Hawk is with us. We've got Jamie Geller again. We've got a lot going on. We also got a shout out to the fourth, the United States of America. Got a lot going on, so let's get started. Uh, remember to like us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and remember, we've got every single week the opportunity to join for our one-on-one learning program. If you want to do one-on-one learning, you got to text one-on-one to 9700. It's a great opportunity to delve into whatever wisdom you're looking for. It's a custom-tailored program. So many people have joined from this group from this show, continue doing it, continue joining. There's so much wisdom that we can share together. Also on Sunday, for those that are subscribed, we're gonna send you an email and it's just a survey. We wanna know what you like about the show, what you wanna see more of, what you, who you wanna you know, see, what you wanna see more or less of. We wanna know from you. We wanna make the show as great as it can possibly be. So look out for that survey, please fill it out. And if you do, you get entered into a raffle um, just for, for doing that. Before we go to our first guest, I want to give a couple of shout outs for those that are watching and you have the opportunity. We love wishing you Shabbat Shalom. It's our way of connecting us together. Shabbat Shalom um, from Michael to Michael and Rochelle Kersner and family from Toronto, Canada. Shabbat Shalom to the Novak family of Toronto. Shabbat Shalom for, to Rifka, Patriots Rock, the Salkaro family from Skokie. They are a, a significant player and a significant part of this program. To Henya from Toronto, Shabbat Shalom to you. Tony and Melissa Leonard in Davie, Florida. Thank you for your kind words. Shabbat Shalom to you. The Silver family from Highland Park. Shiri Ashel from Mountain View, California. Good to see you again. Thank you. Of course, Rifka Manso from Deal. 
Great to see you again. Thank you for joining us every morning on the Daily Boost. For those who want to know more about that, we'll post it on the link here. Um, Ayala Epstein of Toronto, Shabbat Shalom. Harriet Lewis of Woodmere, Shabbat Shalom. Ozzy from Baltimore, Shabbat Shalom. From Scott Rose of the Upper East Side, Shabbat Shalom. Sam from Flapper, Shabbat Shalom. Joel Salesman from Milwaukee. And of course, my buddy Liran, Shabbat Shalom to you. Okay, ready for our first incredible speaker, Mrs. Debbie Greenblatt. Debbie Greenblatt has been educating Jewish women across the spectrum of Judaism for many years. She's the founder of the Women's Division of Gateways Organization. She lectures across the country on Jewish thought and relationships, contributes to Jewish publications, including a column on Jewish thought as it relates to relationships in Mishpacha magazine, a Jewish weekly. She considers herself to be the biggest fan of Jewish women out there. To Debbie, there is nothing better on the planet than Jewish women. She thinks men are good too. She has been blessed with a large family and become a great, she became a great grandmother for the first time yesterday. I've had the opportunity personally to spend holidays with her and her husband and her family. And I gotta tell you, her words are so empowering. It is an honor to have her on the show. Debbie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, I love the video. I love the Corona reference. <laughs> okay, so everyone looks forward to the end of the work week. Time to unwind, time to recharge, rest up, me time. And Shabbos comes on the stage, the day of rest, the day of menucha, which means rest. And sometimes Shabbos does look like that. We disconnect, as the video showed us, from our weekly jobs, whatever they may be, and we, so to speak, put our feet up. But as a woman, I can tell you that sometimes Shabbat, as Charlie said, is not restful at all. First of all, mothers never get a day off. The baby still wakes you, even if it's Friday night. The kids still get up at the crack of dawn and want breakfast, even if it's Shabbat morning. And then they need to be taken care of and entertained and walk to their friends' houses and on and on. Now, Shabbat is not meant to be spent alone. It's meant to be spent with our families and our old friends. And so often, like Charlie said, we invite people into our home and make new friends around the Shabbat table. But as a woman, I have to tell you, you know, all that food doesn't get on the table by itself. Sometimes there's a lot of work that goes not only into the preparation, but the serving and the cleaning. And there were years when my kids were little that Shabbat was the most physically taxing day of the week. So what happened to Shabbat Menucha? What happened to Shabbat rest? So I want to share with you in the few minutes that we have together, a different way of looking at this conce concept of Shabbat Menucha, Shabbat rest. When we want to understand something Judaically, we always go back to where that idea or word appears in our written Torah. So where do we find the word Menucha? So in the book of Ruth, in the story of Ruth, the fascinating story of the great grandmother of King David, so in this book, we find that Naomi is returning to the land of Israel from the land of Moab. And in Moab, she lost everything. She lost her husband. She lost her two children. She lost her money. She's walking back to Israel barefoot. All she has in the world are two daughters-in-law whom she loves very, very much, Ruth and Arpa, the two Moabite women that her, that her children, no longer alive, had married. And she's parting from them. They're each going separate ways. And she wants to give them a blessing. Listen to the blessing she gives them. She says to them, my sweet daughters that I love so much, go home, go home to your mother's house and may each of you find menucha in the home of your husband. She's giving them a blessing that they should get married. Menucha, rest. Anybody that knows anything about marriage knows that marriage is work, not rest. But menucha here means comfort. You know, 
there's a we have when someone god forbid loses a loved one we we comfort the mourners that's called nichama velam it's the same word ruth was giving a blessing to her daughters-in-law and wishing them the comfort of a relationship where someone has your back where someone is concerned where you are and that you're going to get home safely a relationship where someone notices and cares how hard you are working someone with whom to reflect on how far you've come someone with which to celebrate your accomplishments Naomi wasn't just wishing them that they should find a husband but rather that they should find menucha comfort in the building of something meaningful the menucha the comfort of shabbat is the disengagement of the mind from the here and the now and the stepping back to see the bigger picture not the picture of husband and wife though that's a very good metaphor but rather the picture of me and my creator the picture where the jewish people are the bride and god is the groom because once a week we need to go on a date we need to have a date with the one that cares about us more than anyone the one that we can always turn to the one that wants my life to turn out really well and wants to celebrate with me when it does and just like a couple that will often get together and discuss and recalibrate and figure out not only where they are going with their lives but whether in fact they are heading there is what we're doing actually working so too on shabbat it's the time that we as individuals ask ourselves those questions and we too as individual jewish people can recalibrate not just regarding our goals for our careers and our accomplishments and our ac extracurricular activities but our goals for ourselves as jews the comfort of shabbat is the shift in the mindset the knowing that why the knowing why we are doing what we are doing and most importantly knowing that there's meaning and purpose to where we're going and that everything that we're going through and we're all going through stuff now that it has a goal it has a destination it has meaning and has purpose so sometimes we work hard on shabbat and sometimes we don't but the working hard isn't the problem because hard work only wears you out when there's no goal when there's no purpose to that hard work so whether shabbat is an easy one or it's a hard one whether we're together with family and friends or we're by ourselves perhaps because of covid we have the comfort of knowing that when we choose to tune in to a higher frequency the frequency of shabbat and of torah that we are on a journey and that we are actually going somewhere so sometimes at the end of shabbat i'm really tired but also really happy and i can't wait for shabbat to come again thank you so much for inviting me to join on this fabulous program and i want to wish everybody an absolutely wonderful shabbat thank you thank you so much debbie that was wonderful as always and i think it's the perspective that we all need to sort of go in with right now understanding really what shabbat rest really is thank you so much shabbat shalom to you thank and to the family thank and you mazel tov on all the wonderful thank news i mean thank you this weekend is also july 4th and surprisingly July 4th isn't just a holiday that is only for America. It's actually something very interesting in that the Jews had a very big role in the founding of this country. A lot of our principles of our Torah was actually very much a part of the beginning of this country. I'm going to share with you a great video about just how much the Jews were influential in the beginning of the founding of the United States of America. Check this out. The Hebrew Bible lies at the center of the American imagination. 
and it is one of the central inspirations for the founders. Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik leads the oldest Jewish congregation in the United States. He's also a professor at Yeshiva University and told CBN News how Jewish scriptures helped America's founding fathers form the nation we have today. On July 4th, after the Declaration of Independence was approved, and uh, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are forming committee to decide what the seal of the United States would be. The first suggestion that Benjamin Franklin makes uh, once this committee gets going is that the seal of the United States should be Moses and Pharaoh at the sea with the motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And so when Franklin is asked, what story should emphasize or embody what we are trying to do here? The first place his mind goes to is Exodus. And the inspiration goes beyond scripture. Soloveitchik says most Americans would be surprised where the idea of religious freedom originated. Jonas Phillips is uh, a man that I... Working off his debt in Charleston, South Carolina, he moved north, served in the Revolutionary War, and became one of the most prominent Jews in the new nation. But despite his success, religious freedom eluded him. In Pennsylvania, non-Christians could not serve in the legislature. So, in 1787, Phillips decided to push for religious liberty in a big way. Jonas Phillips writes a letter to the convention and to its president. And that president of the convention, of course, is George Washington. So he writes to say that the Jews have, fought, have been passionate patriots and they have fought for the revolution. And in his words, he says, they have fought, the Jews have fought and bled for liberty that they cannot enjoy. You have to appreciate the audacity, right? He's writing to the most revered man in America at the time, George Washington. Washington and the other leaders got the message loud and clear. The Constitutional Convention, not necessarily because of his letter, but the Constitutional Convention concludes with a document that really for the first time bans religious tests for office. Phillips earned the respect of the founders and left quite the legacy. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, attended Phillips' daughter's wedding. And one grandson, Uriah Phillips Levy, not only became the Navy's first Jewish Commodore, he also bought Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and preserved the estate for the American people. You see uh, an extraordinary poetry to the story of this Phillips family and the intertwining of the story of this Jewish family and the story of the founders and the story of America. Amazing for us to appreciate just how much the Torah, the things that we're doing, really doesn't just impact us in our lives, but it's impacted people throughout history. So even as we celebrate the fourth, for those who are celebrating the fourth, for those who live in America, for those who remember, those who've moved, remember that even this great country was able to benefit from the great wisdom that we are sharing here today. And that is a testament to who we are. That same wisdom was such an integral piece to so much of history. And it's a real honor and a pride for me and you to be part of that forever. We're about to get to our next guest who I'm so excited to, to introduce. Before we do that, I wanna get a couple more shout outs to Joel Salzman of Milwaukee, um, to Colette Franco from Brooklyn, Shabbat Shalom, to Arya Mack from Passaic, Shabbat Shalom, Charlie, oh, thank you, to Hillary and Lawrence Hess from Fairlawn, Shabbat Shalom, to Leah, Leah Peril, it's good to see you again, Shabbat Shalom, to the Simons of Phoenix, there were two last week on the Kahoot game. Let's see if they'll disrupt Patriots Rock and her domination. And whoever won last week, I hope that you can introduce yourself. Hanan, your minister and the Minister Family Cincinnati Shabbat Shalom. Okay, now it's time for our next guest. This is an individual I've had, I've had the privilege to hear from multiple times. One of, the most, one of the most touching moments in my life took place this year when I was at MetLife Stadium to the Siam Hashas. Siam Hashas was the concluding of the Talmud, 50,000 people strong in MetLife Stadium. It was a, a scene that 
I'll never forget in a scene that I, I believe is uh, giving every single person who've ever sacrificed the Jewish people an enormous amount of pleasure in heaven. And one of the men, if not the driver of that moment was our next guest. It's an honor to introduce, introduce Saul Werdiger to the Shabbat show for the first time. Saul is an international activist for numerous Jewish causes. He serves on, as the board chairman of Agudath Israel of America, an organization that strengthens Jewish life in this country. He is renowned philanthropist to even more noble charities. But the reason why Saul is joining us today is because the, the hat that he wears that is most interesting here is that he's the founder and CEO of Outer Stuff, a leading producer of sports licensed youth apparel. In simple English, when you buy a shirt or jacket with a Jets or Giants emblem or any of the dozens of other sports teams, it's probably coming from Outer Stuff. He is entrenched with so much of the sports, the uniforms and the clothes that they wear. It's a job that takes him across the world and yet he finds time to be a proud Jew and also take time for Shabbat. So he's going to the Super Bowls and Olympics, but yet he seems to be able to find it. It's an honor to introduce Saul Werdig of the show. Saul, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much and uh, happy fourth. And it's really inspiring, Charlie. I mean, I I'm assuming that, you know, inspiration words from rabbis, you can, we're gonna hear soon from Alan Majeski, from you, Charlie, from Debbie Greenblatt. So, I, I think the purpose of my speaking on the Shabbat program is really to come from a different angle, from a completely different angle, from a more practical uh, a business perspective, and to say to all the people that are on this call that if anybody thinks that, and, and some of you may have heard my stories, it's hard to remember you know, where I've spoken and, and who's heard, but if anybody thinks that for one moment that keeping Shabbat as difficult as it may seem as it be is going to hold you back from accomplishing anything that you'd like to accomplish. I'm the living example, myself and my family, that that's absolutely not true. You know, I live in a world of sports, as Charlie just said. Um, sports is the one thing that doesn't shut down on Shabbat. There's no rest in sports. They play, there's football games on Shabbat, there's baseball games on Shabbat, there's basketball games on Shabbat is special events on Shabbat, but here we are the, the, the business that produces all of that apparel. We do all of the event stuff, so Super Bowl champions, World Series champions, but we shut down on Shabbat. So how does that, how does that happen? Somebody says to me, Saul, how is it possible that you could succeed in a business that's so prone to having to work on Shabbat and still shut down on Shabbat? I'm not going to talk about the, the things that, that Debbie Greenblatt spoke about, or that Charlie spoke about, the spirituality of it, the tranquility of it, the beauty of Shabbat, spending time with your family, shutting down, having some time to spend with your, with your children, eating together a meal. I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm talking about, again, the practical points. And I'm gonna give you some examples, and I'm gonna give you some stories that I think really illustrate to you the, the beauty of Shabbat, and, and you know, I always said to myself, why did God put myself and my children, my family in this business? He could have been, I don't know, could have been a rabbi, Charlie, I could have been, a, 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 you know, a, in the real estate business or, in the, or the, as a lawyer or as a doctor. Why did God, and I think every single time we go through another event, another Super Bowl, another NBA All-Star Game, another World Series, I realize why God put me and uniquely myself and my family in this business because we could really make a difference in this world. And I'm gonna give you an example. It was 25 years ago when I get my first NFL license. So I'm going to my first Super Bowl. So, you know, you go to your first Super Bowl, it's very inspiring, but it's over Shabbat. So I call up the local Chabad guy and we arrange to go to, go to synagogue and we arrange meals and I go with my kids. But I find out that the one mandatory event that you have to attend as a licensee of, at the NFL is a Shabbat uh, brunch. It's a brunch that comes out on Shabbat. So I said to myself, what am I gonna do? It's my first year, I'm a licensee. I, I wanna respect them, but it's still Shabbat. So I Google it, we Google it beforehand and we see it's two miles away from the hotel and it starts at 12 o'clock. So I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I get up in the morning, we find the local, local synagogue, we go pray. I sit down, we have 
a little bit of a Shabbat meal, and I start walking, and I figured I'll show up, and I'll walk to this brunch, I'll pay my respects, and, and do the right thing. So I start walking, and as I'm walking, cars keep on stopping, window rolls down, Saul, it's so hot outside, why don't you, you know, I'll give you a ride. I said, you know, it's my Shabbat, I don't ride on Shabbat. The next guy comes, the third guy comes, at least four or five guys stop me. By the time I get there, the commissioner, was a good friend of mine, Roger Goodell, comes running over to me and he says, Saul, is it true that you walked here? I said, yeah, Roger, it's Shabbat. And I don't ride, you know, we keep, we keep the Shabbat. It's a day of rest. We don't, and I try to explain to him, we don't, we don't get into cars. And he's intrigued. And we talk and I said, Roger, it's not bad enough that I had to walk here, but I also have to walk back this day to a while. You know, so I walk back <clears throat> and now it's a year later and it's two months before the Super Bowl. And my secretary tells me she gets a call from the commissioner's assistant. And the commissioner's assistant is inquiring where is which hotel is Saul staying in for Shabbat at this year's Super Bowl. And so my secretary gives her the name of the hotel, but could I ask why? Because I was so impressed with Saul that he keeps Shabbat that I told the NFL that wherever Saul stays for Shabbat in that hotel, we are going to do this NFL brunch. So listen, listen to this. It's been 25 years, and every single year this NFL brunch takes place in the hotel that myself and my family stay. Wow. And, and, and not only that, it made such an impression on other Jewish people. So now we have a Shabbat meal in the hotel. Because now that we have the ballroom, now that the NFL pays for the ballroom, all we have to do is bring the food. We have services, we have Shabbat meals, we could have 70, 80 people joining us for Shabbat. It made such a Kiddush Hashem, such a sanctify God's name that we do this. And we have countless stories. So instead of me saying, you know, I'm going to bend, this is my livelihood, how am I going to get away with this? This is the NFL, the NFL... The power of Shabbat is bigger than the power of the NFL. The power of Shabbat and the fact that we, we, we really, we sanctify God's name. We keep Shabbat. We have a day of tranquility. We have a day of inner peace and a family day. It only made and strengthened my business relationship with all the professional leagues. I'll tell you a great story. And then I, I, I don't want to, I could go on and on and on in stories. The World Series was once, the last game of the World Series the Yankees were playing was on a Shabbat. And you know that at the end of the games, you know, we have to print. We print, you see those videos all the time of these guys printing T-shirts all night to deliver the next morning in the stores. That's us. We stay up a whole night. We, we contract with printers and World Series champions. And the Yankees were playing, I think it was, I don't know if it was game seven, maybe it was game seven of the World Series. And it was Shabbat. So I go to synagogue, I come home, and I come home after the last prayers, the evening prayers, Saturday night, and my wife tells me, Saul, the phone's been ringing off the wall, off the wall. And so our first thing I do is, you know, I, 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 I want to watch who's playing because who's winning the World Series. I make, I, I, I do have that law. I make the services after the thing. And sure enough, the phone, the second I walk in, the phone rings. I pick up the phone and it's the commissioner. It's Bud Selig, who happens to be Jewish. He says, Saul, why didn't you pick up the phone? I know, I said, because it was Shabbat. He says, but I know Shabbat is over. I said, Bud, how did you know Shabbat is over? He says, I Googled it. And I saw that when there are three stars in the sky, Shabbat is over. I went outside. I was waiting for the three stars to call you, to tell you, you better stop printing those T-shirts. He says, the Yankees, it's the eighth inning. He says, Yankees are winning 7-2. You better stop printing those shirts. He walked, he Googled to see when Shabbat is over, and he realized it was three stars in the sky, and I could pick up the phone. And we have countless, countless stories like this, that, that and people get inspired. How many... People see that we can be successful and stay true to our religion, stay true to the Shabbat. And I think it's, it's not a burden. Anybody that thinks that keeping Shabbat is a burden or it's a hardship, I'm telling you, it's beautiful. It's what keeps you sane. It what keeps you going. It keeps you inspired. And more important than that, by keeping Shabbat, you're not only taking care of yourself and your family, but you can inspire like our family did Dozens, maybe hundreds of other people, people stop me in the street all the time. I wouldn't believe it. It's all thanks to you, us and our family. We started slow. First, my wife lights candles and we have a Friday night meal with the kids. And slowly but surely, we realized 
what this, the inner beauty, the inner tranquility that it brings to myself, my family, because of you and because of your family, because of the inspiration that you were in, in Shabbat, we have become a whole different family. I've become a whole different person and more successful. So my message is, it's not a rabbinical message. It's a practical message that if you think for whatever reason that keeping Shabbat is going to hold you back from accomplishing anything you want, you're 100% wrong. Take it from me, take it from my family. And anybody that wants to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give Charlie or, or Rabbi Samson my number. You're more than welcome to call me or email me if you need any, any guidance of how to, how to do this. I, again, I'm in a world that I, I really don't see anybody Jewish in, in the business. You know, I don't see it. it. You know, yeah, there are a lot of sports owners and things that are that are Jewish, but the leagues themselves, the people that I interact with, are not. But they've all now gotten to know and understand the beauty of the day of rest, the God's gift, the greatest gift that God gave us and our families. So, with that message, I want to wish thank you for having me on the show, Charlie. Wow. Thank you for all the beautiful work you do and everybody else, and a, and a very very wonderful Shabbat to everybody that's on this call. Thank you for having. Me. Thank you, Saul, and thanks for your kind words, and thanks for your words of inspiration. I think one of the things that we're getting here on the show is a deeper understanding of what Shabbat's supposed to do, and Saul really is bringing us there, this idea that Shabbat's not just about disconnecting from technology. It's something much deeper. It's a perspective in life. It's understanding who we are. It's understanding when we stand strong and we're proud of who we are. We can see the world in a different way. And what I took so inspiring from the, soul, the, the story that Saul just mentioned was that his clarity of what his, his values were sort of allowed him to see the world in a certain way and the world came to him versus going to the world. In many ways, that's really what Shabbat is getting at. It's trying to get us to stop what we're doing in order to gain perspective to recalibrate our values, to determine what is most important in our lives. It's building us so that our glasses are cleaner and cleaner and our lenses are clearer and clearer. Thank you, Saul, for your kind words. We're gonna to go to a couple more Shabbat Shalom's before we get to Kahoot. Kahoot's coming next. So for those who want, start loading it because Kahoot's coming next and I'm gonna to go to Shabbat, to some more Shabbat Shalom's as I turn to my Project Inspire team and tell them to please start launching the Kahoot. We're going to go to Kahoot right now, but until then, uh, to Hanania, Minister and the Minister family, Shabbat Shalom to you. To Miriam from Brooklyn, Shabbat Shalom to you. To Eliot, Eliana and Eric, Shabbat Shalom from Brooklyn, Shabbat Shalom to you. To Ann Ehrenzweig, Shabbat Shalom to Ann from Las Vegas, Shabbat Shalom. Project Inspire, let's get Kahoot going while I'm doing this. Um, to Michelle and Ro Rochelle, to Michael and Rochelle Sullivan from Baltimore, Shabbat Shalom to you. Okay, Kahoot's coming on right now. Everyone get your Kahoot screens, go to kahoot.it. Here's the code, 730-5114. Ozzy's on, that's right. The team is coming back in. I'm waiting, Ken's on, Patriots Rock's on. Here comes, Lee Ron's playing big today. The Sullivans, it's gonna be a big day. I'm feeling it. We just had Saul, we just spoke about the Super Bowl. We're gonna get rocking. It's gonna be our own Super Bowl here on Kahoot. Has families on. A couple more Shabbat Shalom as people start uh, uh, signing on. The Trenches of Stanford, Connecticut, and West Hartford. Shabbat Shalom to you. To Carol and Gordon Drucker. Shabbat Shalom to you. To the Popels in Miami. Shabbat Shalom to Helen in Toronto. Karen Levy from Toronto. It's, wait, hold on. To Richard Bissett, it's his father's 32nd yard site. Yaakov Shem Ben Yosef, may he, ha may he, has a, may he have a Elias Neshama. As everyone piles on, let's go. Kahoot IT, one more minute to get on. It's a tough, quick game, so you got to get on quickly. We'll get a couple more seconds. I'm going to do three more Shabbat Shalom's and we can get rolling here. Roger and Erica for Southampton. Shabbat Shalom to you. Miriam Friedman from Ottawa, Canada. Thank you, Howard. Shabbat Shalom to you and God bless America. Aria Mack, Lisa Weber from Muncie, Pomona. Okay, let's get rolling. Shabbat Shalom to you. And let's get going on Kahoot. Here we go. First question. Speaking about rest. The average percentage of a person's life spent sleeping is 16, 33, 50, 72. You get more points the quicker you answer. You gotta just jump on this thing. You get a lot of points for going quick. While we do that, Nirla Carmeli, Shabbat Shalom, Northern Illinois. Thank you for, for today. Thank you. 
Shabbat and Abe Adler from Fair Lawn. Shabbat Shalom to you. Okay, here we go. Oh, six seconds left. Come on, get them all in. Jody, Jody and Toby, Shabbat Shalom to you, the Brookhall families. Okay, here we go. First answer is 33%. Can you imagine a third of our lives sleeping? It's a lot of time. How are we doing? Oh, God. Patriots Rock begins early. Aviva, Rachel Potolsky, Jordana, and Ozzy. Got to watch out for Ozzy. Ozzy climbs the boards all the time. Okay, Patriots Rock is still at the top. Here we go, number two. How do we say, which of these words is Hebrew for independence? This, if you've been watching the show, we spoke about it. I'll give you a hint. There's a yom before it. Ish, ishli, levad, atzma'ut, tapuach, eitz. How do you say independent? My hint, think of the word yom. There's a holiday that's connected to this in Israel, just to even the playing field for everybody, whether you speak Hebrew or not. So, Miller, July 1st. Oh, we didn't know that. July 1st. For the Canadians, is their Independence Day. So happy Independence Day to Canada as well. Okay, 54%. Good. Yom Ha'atzma'ut is Israeli Independence Day. That's how you say independence. Okay, next question. Let's see how we do on the board here. P Rachel Potolsky's climbing Patriots Rock. Jordana Gibbs and Aviva. Okay, here we go. Number three. How many categories of work in Shabbat are there on Shabbat? Okay, how many categories of work? 39, 72, 109, and 613. How many categories of work are there on Shabbat? 39, these are general categories. 613 are all the mitzvot. These are just general categories. How many categories of work? Yosef Do Farrell of Pepsaic, Shabbat Shalom to you. The Rosenfelds from Munsey, Shabbat Shalom from you. Michael Miller from Nassau, Bahamas. Shabbat Shalom. Let's go to the answer. The answer is 39. Excellent. 39 uh, categories of work. Let's see how we do on the leaderboard right now. Patriots Rock is climbing. Gibbs, Jordan, and the Novaks from Toronto are getting up there. And Aviva still in the game. Let's keep on going. Last group. Even if you're not playing, you're, you're, you're watching the race, no? Which of these famous people wrote a book about Shabbat? Who wrote a book about it? Senator Joe Lieberman? Senator Diana Feinstein, Steven Spielberg, or Sigmund Freud? Who wrote a book about Shabbat? Alan and Stacey Levinrad from California and Maryland. Shabbat Shalom. Diana Park in Waterloo, Ontario. Shabbat Shalom. Lori Solomon and family from Suffern. Shabbat Shalom. Awesome. Senator Joe Lieberman. Excellent. Let's see how we do this. Let's see who's winning. Here it is. Third place, Gibbs. Second place, the Novaks from Toronto. First place is... Aviva. Amazing. We have a new leader today. Congratulations, Aviva, for your, for your leadership here. Excellent work. Great job, everybody honor a couple more shabbat shaloms i want to go to my facebook for the quick shabbat shalom uh sharon sharon leduck shabbat shalom from virginia shabbat shalom to deborah cohen nancy hillens rash shabbat shalom josh brody josh brody from boca shabbat shalom carolyn fetter shabbat shalom deborah cohen shabbat shalom michael gret Wergen, shabbat shalom thank you everybody for tuning in and we're going to keep on going over here our next guest is an incredible guy i've had the honor to know to work with to be together uh, on various programs. Uh, Mr. Justin Hawk is part of an organization that I've really seen firsthand what they've done. It's called Olami. They're a partner with us on this show. They've got 320 branches across 30 countries. They're inspiring Jewish students with wisdom, Jewish wisdom around the world and introducing them to the beauty of Shabbat. It's an organization that has really reached students from all over the world. And we have today one of their stars. Justin has graduated from the University of Maryland this December. He's involved with AEPI and Ma'or. He has been working with Olami to figure out ways to get more students involved in Jewish education, and Jewish practices, to work with Jewish professionals. He's started his career in January. He's moved back to Maryland. Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, I appreciate you having me on the show. Um, and also a thank you to Olami um, for providing me all the resources that have brought me to this point and to Project Inspire for putting this weekly pre show on. 
Amazing. It's an honor to have you on. Talk to us a little about your background, you know, how you got involved, how you got to, you, you went to the University of Maryland, then you got involved in all of me. Just give us like a, you know, get, let us, tell us a little more about you. Happy to do so. So I, you know, was raised in a reformed traditional household, uh, going to synagogue on the high holidays. Most of my time and focus was geared towards competitive hockey. So when someone, you know, asked me, are you Jewish? I focused more on the ish side growing up. Um, and so, you know, that, that led me on to the path of really focusing on, on hockey, which then I, I played at uh, the University of Delaware. So wow. to give a little background, um, I actually left and transferred to the University of Maryland my sophomore year, which was pretty crazy to say the least of picking up everything that I've ever really loved and been really passionate about and going on a hunch. And that hunch ended up paying out uh, in numerous different ways um, from the people that I've met to now being involved in Alami. So when I got to the University of Maryland, uh, my brother was actually a freshman at the time and him and I made a plan to go on birthright and um, have internships in Israel during the summer. And it really was there that I tasted, um, you know, and was reconnected with my Jewish identity. Um, we, you know, we learned, we felt the spirituality and it was both of our first times in Israel. And for everyone that, that, you know, has, has been to Israel and, you know, has really felt the, the strength, um, of your Jewish identity come out. Um, and so, you know, while I was there, I, I really took, uh, an appreciation and enjoyment out of learning and being around, um, you know, Jewish texts and, um, you know, it, I, I go back and I, I really kind of say this story, not as a selling point, but just something that really connected with me. Um, I was living in Tel Aviv. I mean, I was working in Herzliya doing a, a real estate analyst position. Um, that was awesome, especially being in Herzliya. But I really connected to Aish when I was in Jerusalem for a couple of times. So um, I would, there would be some days where crazy as it sounds, I would get off work um, in Herzliya at 3.30 and I would take a bus and go to Aish for some night classes that I worked out with, with Rav Gav and uh, Dov Bear Cohen for, for you know, individuals that know him. And from there, honestly, I was, I was hooked and I was connected. And there was another rabbi that, you know, throughout the programming said to me, and, and we worked together on it, that, you know, this is someone that for me, I didn't necessarily know what Shabbat was. Um, I wasn't really connected throughout my entire life, but something that my brother and I really connected to and, and we worked together, especially being at, at home with my family. Um, if, if we choose to do something different, either Friday night and or on Shabbat or Saturday, it's we're keeping Shabbat together as a family. Um, and I think that's most important and really what's kept me um, learning and, and desiring more to understand what Shabbat is. Because, you know, when I first started out, I didn't understand that there were 39, you know, ways of work. But ultimately, being at where I am today and understanding and, and feeling the connectivity, feeling the spirituality and feeling the love and compassion that, you know, my family is able to give me, I'm able to give them. But also within the communities that I've, I've been to and, and the different homes I've, you know, have, have warmly been welcomed to. It's amazing, you know, what the power of Shabbat really brings out, not just, you know, to me, but as a community and what we can, you know, give to each other during Shabbat is something that I will, you know, Bezrat Hashem provide my family because, you know, as, as Debbie and Saul alluded to before, it takes you away from the week and you're able to provide something for your family, for your loved ones, for the greater Jewish community which ultimately helps you out through where you've been, where you are now, and ultimately, you know, the future. Amazing. Well, Justin, thanks so much for your words. And they mean a lot coming from you. Everyone comes from different backgrounds. And when you see people from different perspectives and different backgrounds, being able to look at the same part of our tradition, part of our, our history, it means, it, it means a lot to us. And thanks for your leadership. And you continue to inspire and to grow. It's an honor to have you on the show. Man, thank you, Charlie. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom to you. Coming up next is Jamie Geller. As we all know, Jamie Geller is our partner on the show. Every week brings us inspiration through food, which is how Jews operate. Jamie Geller is coming up next. Check out her new video. Thank you 
so much, Charlie, and hi, everyone. We are back, but I'm gonna make it super quick today because we have an amazing video for you. I'm gonna show you how to make an entire Shabbat meal in just one hour. That's the fish for the starter, the chicken and rice for your entree, and a fantabulous fruit crisp for dessert. Enjoy this for Shabbat dinner, Shabbat lunch, or for the third meal, just serve the fish and the crisp. Let's get cooking. Betea Bon and Shabbat Shalom. Keep that in mind as you prepare your July 4th barbecues. Jamie's always there to take care of us. Of course, you can get more of Jamie Geller. Go to jamiegeller.com. Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, TikTok, at Jamie Geller and at Jewish by, Jewish by Jamie. Our next guest is a rabbi who I am incredibly fond of. Great guy, inspiring the world with his videos, with his shul, with his messages. Come at us from the West Coast. Um, the one and only Rabbi Yisrael Majeski. <laughs> Rabbi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charlie. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. It's an honor to have you on. What? Well, please inspire us with your wisdom, oh my with your wit, and with all that you are to bring us closer and closer to hold that we can be on Shabbat. Wow, what an honor to be here. Because I'm still thinking about that food that Jamie was just, you know, I need a minute to process that <laughs> and get back into into rabbi mode. Oh, Charlie, you know, I, I, I want to start off with a, with an oldie but a goodie. But, you know, I've heard Rabbi Becker say this so many times. I'm sure you have as well. Uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Hello, Project Inspire Land. So Rabbi Becker says over the most awesome story where one time he was in Hong Kong and he was put up in a hotel and he was put up like on the 45th floor. And... It was Shabbat, and there was no Shabbat elevator, which means he was going to be doing a lot of walking. And after he finishes speaking, doing his, his little thing, he walks up to the 45th floor, and it was a hot summer day, and he is sweating buckets. And he finally pushes open the door and literally, like, just collapses. And this woman walks by him and says, excuse me, sir, is everything okay? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. It's okay. Water. What? She's like, why didn't you take the elevator? He says, because it's my day of rest. <laughs> I'm sorry. And he said, you could just imagine the look that she gave him. You know, it's like, wow. He said, and then it hit me. What exactly does this mean, the day of rest? It's a lot easier to go into the car. It's a lot easier to press the button on the elevator. It's a lot more restful, restful to stay at home and just chill and go to the beach. What is this day of rest when we say Shabbat is a day of rest? So I want to share with you an idea which I heard from a very close friend of mine who lives in Los Angeles. His name is Rabbi Dovin Morris. And he said, you know, if, you, if, if you're into cars, my kids are really into cars, I like know what a Toyota Camry is and a minivan. You know, Charlie, that's like, that's like where I end. But my kids know all the... <laughs> the kids know the BMWs and the, the horsepower, the CVXQs, all the different things. And my friend said, he said, if you want to look at a car, and if you're into cars, well, the first thing you want to know is how fast does it go? He says, but what's the really, what's really an even more important question than how fast the car goes? He says, is how well does it stop? Right? Did anyone ever hear of Brembo before? Anyone ever hear of Brembo? No, I didn't either. Brembo is the braking system on the Ferrari. 
and on the McLaren and on many of the fastest cars in the world. They have a special system with heat pads and a lot of stuff going on to make sure that the car stops. Because if your car goes fast, that's all great. But if you don't know how to stop, then your car is not going to really do much good for you. We are always moving. We are going. We are flying. We are rocking. We are rolling. We are dealing. We are, we are machines, as the Talmud says. We are meant to work. Adam Amal Yulad, we were put here to work. And that's why when we're not working, we're stuck in quarantine. We're like, get me out of here. I need to move. And moving is awesome. And creating is awesome but you also have to know how to stop, how to hit the brakes. You know what Shabbat's about? Shabbat is stopping. When God created the world for six days, he was doing the, he was doing the most amazing thing ever. Look outside. Look at yourself. Look what God did during the six days of creation. On the seventh day, he stopped. And he reflected. And he looked back. And he was now able to analyze the world and say, now, let me see where this is going. How is you and me, how are we going to go ahead and continue building this beautiful creation? That's what Shabbat's about. Shabbat is about realizing that we got to take that step back. And Shabbat means Shav to sit, to stop moving and ask and analyze, and think, and realize what we are doing here. And what, what do I really want to be doing when I'm not getting lost in, 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 in the hubble and the run? So, just one second, Sharon, you're going to wind it up. My daughter's looking at me. She found my hiding spot. She always find my hiding spot. I want to leave you with an idea that I heard from Rabbi Sholem Rush. He put out a video a couple of years ago. Not, not too many people compete with Charlie's videos out there, but this one, this, this hit the spot. Rabbi Aru said that one of his students told him he went into a cab from up north in Israel, near Tzfat, and it was an expensive cab where he had to go into, all the way to Jerusalem. And he's in the cab, and he's in the back of his seat, and he looks up, you know, you're an Israeli cab, you start talking, hello, how are you, what's your favorite food, shawarma, falafel, they're doing their thing. And all of a sudden, he sees in the passenger seat next to him, there is the next to the driver, there's another steering wheel. So there's the driver who's driving, and then there's, in the passenger seat, there's another steering wheel. There's two steering wheels. So he looks at him in the Hebrew, he says, Ata nahag no hagim? Do you, do you teach drivers? Are you a driver's ed teacher? He says, no, no. He says, can I ask you why do you have two steering wheels? Are you from England? Did you like switch the steering wheels to the other side? He says, no. He says, why do you have two steering wheels? Listen to what this cab driver said. He says, well, I have a little boy. His name is Kobe. And Kobe, he likes to drive. Most of really start driving like five years old, six years old. And he says, whenever I'm driving, he always sticks his hand on the steering wheel and he tries driving as well. He says, even in Israel, you know, having little kids drive at the same time, I, I couldn't do it. And then I, I, I had a great idea. What if I go ahead and get him his own steering wheel? I just put it over there by the dashboard. And when I drive, I tell him, yo, you drive also. You drive as well. And that's what I did. My friend was giving away a car. I took out the steering wheel. I put it in. Now, whenever I go driving, he is steering. Abba, turn to the left. You go this way. Up. And he thinks he's driving the car. And this man tells a story to Rabbi Arush. Rabbi Arush starts crying. He says, now I get it. Now I understand life. He says, Hashem, God is driving the car. He, he knows exactly what he's doing in this world. But we also want to drive the car. We want to work and we want to, we want to build. We have all these great things. And God wants us to. Do you know what he does? He gives us a steering wheel. And he says, you also get to drive you get to drive as well. But just know one thing. I'm really the one leading the way. I'm the one driving your car. So you could relax. Yes, we got to go out and build and create 
and use our God-given talents to go ahead and change the world and build in our businesses and our families and become the greatest people out there. But so many times we're stuck in traffic and so many times we're afraid of drunk drivers and so many times we're in the this lane or this fast highway of life, my friends, and we feel like we're losing control. Can you imagine if you would actually realize that there's someone else driving the car? Let go. Watch. Let go. Hands up on the roller coaster. Hands up. And the roller coaster is still moving. Yes, you got to be in the car. You got to do your thing. God helps those who help themselves. You got to go ahead and do whatever you could do, but ultimately understand that God has, God has this all worked out. Someone just told a special person in Israel, he says, this Corona is out of control. And this rabbi, Rabbi Ellison looked at him and said, no, it's out of your control. <laughs> it's in control. It's just not, it might not be yours control. But yes, we, God has this under control. One guy eating some bat in China. Turn this whole world upside down. But don't think for a moment that there's no one driving that car. That's what Shabbat's about. Shabbat is about stopping and looking back and saying, I could let go because I know that God is right here driving next to me. And therefore, I have to ask myself, how much overwork, how much overtime, how much am I doing, how am I pushing myself when the way I can really just take a step back and focus on what I want to become, on who I want to become, on the type of son, daughter, father, parent, spouse, you name it, who do I want to be? And you're able to do that on Shabbat. Because what does it mean to rest? When that lady asked Rabbi Becher, why don't you press the elevator? You know what he did? He didn't create. He didn't create an electrical current. He didn't go ahead and say, I am in control. I am going to create. He stopped creating. He recognized that, God, you are the creator. And I'm in your world. And thank you for letting me be part of this amazing world. Thank you for, for giving me this heritage, for giving me this identity, for giving me this direction of the Torah. And we each got our own pace. And we each got our own struggles. And we each got our own legacy that we're building. But let me tell you, I'll end with this. If we really take this point of Shabbat to heart, and whenever there's chaos in our lives, we understand who else who's driving this, driving this car for us. It enables you to, to take such a breath and it enables you to really focus on what you really want to accomplish. That's how that's that, that that's what I take from Shabbat. That's what Shabbat rest really means to me. And I'm looking forward for a nice bowl of chunt. I'm looking forward to spending time with my family. I had a very hectic week. We started camp over here, 250 kids coming off of masks and temperature tests. And there's a lot of things going on. And this Shabbat, I'm gonna kick back, have a nice cold one. When I say cold one, I mean a uh, nice cold Diet Coke. Um, and really just, just just give it up. Give it up to the one above. So my blessing to all of you is get that experience of Shabbat in. Feel it. Connect to it. It's the greatest gift in the world. Thank you so much, Charlie, for having me on. Thank you, Project Inspire. And let's do it. Let's rock Shabbat. Thank you, Rabbi. As always, very inspiring. You know exactly the words that we need to hear and the stories we need to hear. Thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom to you. Shabbat Shalom to all, the, you, all those that have, that have uh, t tapped in before as we leave the silvers to Jen, to, um, to Dahlia Layton from LA. I want to end with the following line. And really, for me, at least when I heard this, it really changed for me. Remember, Shabbat Shalom is not the day of rest. We're Jews. We work really hard. Shabbat Shalom is the day of perspective. And sometimes the things that are the most important are right in front of our eyes. We just can't see them. The world's going too quick. We're not disconnecting so that we just see our family. We're disconnecting that we just see things that we couldn't see otherwise. Who we are, who's in control, what's the most important part of my life. When we disconnect from the world, we realize that that soul that's inside us is a chance to breathe, a chance to influence, and a chance to give us a perspective as we see the world in a way that we couldn't otherwise. 
from me and mine to you and yours, I wish you a Shabbat filled with that perspective. May we see the world for what it is. And we realize that there's something controlling beyond us. May we go through life fighting for the things that are the most important, putting our values above everything, taking chances, creating relationships, finding rest in the way that Debbie said earlier what it really is, finding strength in the way that Saul mentioned the strength, taking opportunities in front of us the way Justin did, being able to go piece by piece and seeing each and every one of these incredible opportunities that are in front of us. And like Rabbi Yisrael Majeski just said, being able to let go. And with that, we should have true peace. Shabbat Shalom is Shabbat of peace, true peace. So for me and mine to you and yours, I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. I hope and pray that next week you get to this in Jerusalem. But if not, with God's help, I can't wait to speak to you again next week. Shabbat Shalom. We together call it ah, do, ah, shoot. With every generation, they take one raising the haters. Then I shimmy the pavement, blazing the savers. And the world acts where they win. Patience are faithless. The Torah get the whole world a facelift. If hatred is baseless, we take it, erase it, and exchange it for that master goal. We don't forget wherever we may go. There is only one place we know, and it's called Zero. Yeah. Yeah. You have the pieces, and you just call it out.